On November 14th, 1943, a convoy of battleships were on their way to a war conference in North Africa. This was one of a dozen conferences that would pave the way to an Allied victory in World War II. It would involve leaders like Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin. One of these escorting battleships, the USS Iowa, was carrying the most powerful man in America, the 32nd President of the United States, and the man credited with leading us out of the Great Depression, Franklin D. Roosevelt. FDR was on the deck of the Iowa, enjoying the Atlantic sea air, and watching the men of the Iowa carry out an anti-aircraft exercise. That's when another battleship, one of the four ships in the convoy, fired on the USS Iowa. The strange part was, it wasn't the enemy who did the shooting. It was friendly fire from another U.S. battleship, the William Porter, that launched a torpedo at FBR by accident. Incredibly, Franklin D. Roosevelt watched from the deck of the Iowa as the torpedo sped through the waves. He didn't ask the Secret Service to take him to safety. He didn't try to flee below deck, like I would, or have his men load him into a lifeboat. FDR told his Secret Service to bring him to the railing so he could watch the torpedo approaching. And when it was close to the USS Iowa, FDR had his Secret Service pull out their service pistols. You're listening to The Re-Engineered You. This is a podcast about self-empowerment and all the myths, lies, and misconceptions we tell ourselves. Then we use science and history to bust those myths and re-engineer a better you. My name is Todd Laments, your host, the extrovert, and I'm joined by researcher, writer, and introvert, Joe Anthony. Good evening, Todd. Good to see you, Joe. Good to see you. Today we're talking about Franklin D. Roosevelt, a golden example of a leader who shined under stress. And I want to review with you the three key parts of FDR's life that we all learned in school. One, FDR was an under-the-gun leader who dug us out of the Great Depression and led us to victory in World War II. The man did not cave under pressure. Like any good leader, pressure hardened him like a diamond. Point two, FDR was a man of the people. Do you remember those fireside chats? FDR connected with his people. He empathized with them. All great leaders empathize with their people, right? He seemed to have his fingers on the pulse of the whole country. Point three, FDR got polio and lost the use of his legs as an adult. This should have been a career-ending blow for him as a politician. FDR should have crumbled under the stress, but it fueled him. Like all great leaders, he excelled because of his hardship. He was forged by them. At least these are the myths that everyone loves to spread about FDR. And not surprisingly, we apply these myths to modern leaders. Myths like, great leaders thrive under pressure. High-powered leaders know their people. And the worst offender, leaders are discovered during times of stress, and they're trained under fire. With a little help from history and modern psychology, we're going to dispel these myths for you and help provide us with the keys we need to become a better leaders and better people. But first, let's look at how a man in a wheelchair can dodge a torpedo. So, Todd, at this point, uh, you know about the William D. Porter? I've heard stories about it. I read a humongous thousand-page novel called The Man of Destiny before we did this show. It was all about FDR's life, and there was a section in there about <laughs> the William D. Porter. So, you are a little bit more versed in this than I am at this point. I read a goofy, cracked article because uh, I need cartoons to explain things to me. <laughs> and uh, the way they described it was, they said it was the police academy of escort destroyers. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that anti-Navy SEALs. If you were a screwed up sailor on all the other ships, they would send you for some reason and put you on this boat. So why they were on that convoy and why they did friendly fire and of all the ships to fire on, the one with the, the leader of our country, the leader of the free world, is, it should tell you enough. Right. <laughs> I, I like the, the anti-Navy SEAL. So these guys were uh, basically in punishment already. It was, <laughs> it was the timeout ship. <laughs> timeout, yes. So um, from what I was reading, the first time they started this escort, so they were, they were put on duty, and they're going to be taking the president out. And upon leaving uh, shore to take the president out, they scraped a deck. Is that true? 
was that the one with the anchor? They dropped yeah. an anchor and drove off the thing. They drove the ship off with the, with the anchor still down, which is not being a sailor or, or a Navy officer. I think you're supposed to pull that up. Oh, right, right. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's a little bit to that, I think. I don't think the ship goes without taking the anchor out first. Uh, so they, they start with massive damage. Uh, if that's not like a cursed ship or, or a, a sign of a cursed ship. They're already late. They don't right. have time for that. <laughs> that. That's like somebody going to work and they're just like backing up and they're taking a car, like a, <laughs> another car's mirror and then like they have a, a tricycle dragging behind them as they go. So uh, the William D. Forder leaves and during this escort, uh, they they have some infractions and they're putting time out. Like they're, they're screening, basically, from what I could understand. And while they're out in the Atlantic, they're, uh, they're doing these exercises and... While they're doing the exercises, that's when they fire the torpedo? The story goes, it was a training exercise, and they're supposed to be firing blanks. And they did fire two blanks. But then the third one they did was a live round. So they're firing live ammunition they weren't supposed to be. So if you can imagine like a a cap gun, you hear like two pop, pop, and then an actual round goes off. Right, and a $100,000 Whatever torpedoes cost in the good old days, right? <laughs> is wasted too. And you can kill people too and sink another ship. Right. I, I don't know how much torpedoes cost back in that day, but almost all <laughs> armaments cost the military. a lot, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's always like, oh, they're firing a house, basically. <laughs> so um, they fire the torpedo. And because they were already in timeout, from what I could understand, uh, they asked permission to break radio silence. Yeah, so, yeah. So even though this is a life or death situation, they had time enough to do that protocol. <laughs> and yeah, exactly. You, you know, your vitals. But that should show you what knuckleheads these guys are. Right. So like when you when you put a kid in the corner for being bad, yeah. they ask if they have permission to ask. You know, like, can I talk? Your little brother's drowning in the pool. Yeah, you have permission to go yell and say to your parents. <laughs> right. You don't have to ask for permission. Can I talk to you right now? Yeah, the curtains are this in fire. Good time. Speak up. <laughs> yeah. So um. Now, now I, the part about the Secret Service drawing their guns, I tried to confirm that so hard because I want that poster. <laughs> I, I want it's like a Simpsons cartoon, like like ordering them to draw their guns. Um, but the the part about the service, the the service pistols being drawn, uh, that is reported that they did it, uh, but not why. And the orders and things like that are in contention. But his reaction, FDR's reaction, that is totally confirmed. Well, that's how he is. He's just such a cool cat. And I think that's part of it, probably from his disabilities. And and in that time, you know, a four-term president dragging us out of the Great Depression, not a little recession, and not just some combat, but World War II. Right. I mean, to have that all in your lifetime, they say when you're a president, it ages you 20 years. Well, what would four terms do to you? And being in a wheelchair and being, you know, you have polio, your your health is compromised too. Right. You don't sleep well at night. You're It's a terrible, terrible disease. Right, Obama's hair turns you know white overnight yeah. in the presidency. <laughs> exactly, right. with, a, with you know with ten two percent as much stress as FDR had. Right, yeah. Obama never sat while a torpedo raced after him. Like <laughs> I, I met, like my hair would just turn white and then fall out immediately. Yeah. So, um, why didn't the torpedo kill FDR? It hit a big wave, and for the, for the, for his for him and for us, we're lucky. Right, I did. So it was um, so it was a, a wake from the ship that it hit, yeah, and it, then it, it, it detonated, the and it detonated, and and went made a big noise and big splash of water, but uh, but didn't sink the ship. And that's the poster I want. Just just <laughs> two Secret Service members, pistols drawn, <laughs> seeing the explosion as this thing goes off. It's a pretty cool cat. Man. Yeah, I, I don't know if anybody, <laughs> you know. That's very Bruce Willis like, right? If they had TV, <laughs> that would be uh, that would be the reelection campaign. Is like, like reelect me. I did this, and it would just yeah. be a picture of a torpedo. Yeah. yeah. That brings us to our first myth. School and TV taught me that great leaders are forged in fire. Like FDR, great leaders are battle hardened, stress tested. Do you remember the movie Patton? The part where General Patton jumps through the window pulls out his pistol to shoot back at a fighter plane. Leaders are stress-tested, battle-hardened. Stress-tested. That's what I imagined FDR was for politics in the 1930s. An under-the-gun leader 
who literally rebuilt the country to drag us out of the Great Depression. He's the only American who's ever won four presidential terms. And as if our digging our nation out of a financial ruin wasn't enough, FDR took us to victory over the Axis in World War II. This man did not cave under pressure. Don't we see this in the business world today? Great leaders like Bill Gates and Mark Cuban, don't they thrive under pressure? Okay, so um, when I got into this research, I was surprised by what I found. I figured that um, something about my frail mortal body and mind made me react badly to pressure and makes me a bad leader. <laughs> I was happy, almost happy, uh, like in I a shot enough. Way. You are man enough to do this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this has taught me a few things about myself. <laughs> okay. um, so I was looking up uh, Harvard University uh, and their research studies about cortisol. And this one was done by Gary Sherman and Jennifer Lerner. And they went around and they tested high-status leaders. So what I mean by high-status, uh, leaders that have a lot of people under them. So we're talking like Wall Street, uh, lawyers, people that work in huge offices, and they have thousands of people under them. Okay, CEOs, so not, larger businesses. Exactly, yeah. And they cheek swab them. And it, it, that's the simple test. It, it's, it's not, you know tell us whether you're a good leader or not. It, it was just yeah. taking hormones. Not showing them these pictures and saying, what does this mean to you or anything? It's right. Real, okay. Yeah, they would just come in and, you know, like before their morning coffee when they get a fresh swab <laughs> <laughs> and they would cheek swab them. And they found that the high performance leaders, the uh, leaders with a lot of people under them, they have low cortisol, so lo low stress hormone and high testosterone. And Cortisol, uh, the stress hormone, that, that's the hormone that uh, lets us fight bears, basically. Like, it's the, um, you, you get sweaty, your fists clench, you know, things are too stressful for you to handle. So if I'm walking out to the car from the grocery store, and a dog barks, and I get that adrenaline, just jump, right? That's what that's cortisol, right? That's exactly right. Yeah. And as a leader, for me, uh, if I try to, you know, manage a group of people, I feel that. I feel like a dog is barking at me and it's just people are under me. I, I work for these people and they're, they're these mid managers. They major in minor things. They make everything into a big deal. And with more than a team of five, their heads would probably explode because they're already stressed out. Their blood pressure is raised and they stress everyone out around them also. It, exactly. It's uh, leaders that have high stress are also low leaders. They're, they're the leaders that, you know, they have a small team, they're red-faced, and they're blaming and yelling at their team. And that's a, a, a high-stress, uh, you know, high-testosterone leader. The low cortisol, that, now this is where we get into um, these vaunted CEOs that we almost look up to like deities. Like, you know, they're, they're walking around on, you know, red carpets and things. They know everything. Right. They always know the answer. And these, these lots of subordinate leaders they just experience less stress than us. Because they couldn't major in everything or else their, their heads would explode. If they worried about what every single department was doing, what every single employee was coming in late, they wouldn't be able to make big decisions. Right. And that's the part that really struck me is, is knowing this, that uh, really it's just about stress. Like the, the leadership, it, I think the takeaway for me reading this research was high performance leaders have low stress and that makes all the difference. So back to my man, FDR, if we're talking about CEOs doing this, what about leaders of countries with millions of people? Right. That's when we get into um, people complain about uh, presidents who are leading countries like, oh, they take too much time off. Like Obama is playing basketball and Trump is playing <laughs> golf. It's like, no, these are coping mechanisms. Like <laughs> they have better stress mechanisms than I do. And that seems to really benefit them. That makes sense. That's interesting. So that gives us our first misconception that FDR was a man of action who thrived under stress. We all love to spread the myth that leaders and hiring CEOs thrive under pressure. Nobody thrives under pressure. In reality, FDR had what all great leaders throughout history have had and what CEOs today should strive to achieve. Incredible stress coping techniques. Techniques to manage lower cortisol levels. FDR was a master of stress management. FDR knew the value of humor in stress management. 
and he knew the value of relaxation too. He took a three-year fishing vacation after he lost the use of his legs. We don't talk about that side of leadership, do we? We'll tag our emails with clever little quotes by famous leaders. Quotes about winning battles and inspiring men. But you never see an email with a tagline, Franklin D. Roosevelt owned a day spa and went fishing for three whole years. Okay, so when you were in school, you heard about him getting polio, right? Yep, that's the first thing you hear about him. That's the only thing I remembered out of school about <laughs> FDR is polio. Yeah. And uh, the one thing I remembered and the one thing that stands out in everybody's mind apparently was not true. Really? So there's a immune disorder. And it's it's ironic that it's happening right now. The uh, This COVID thing affects people who have uh, immune system problems. Uh, this is kind of similar, where if you can have your immune system attack the body... It's all kinds of bad. It's like allergies. Um, there's a syndrome called Gillian Barr syndrome. And the immune system in this syndrome uh, basically attacks your nerves. It frays them. And it's extraordinarily painful. Uh, and that's what historians now believe FDR had. Now, we've talked about this offline. So polio was considered at the time to be a poor man's disease because it came out of the man of destiny. I've read this book out of the sewer system and people in poor neighbors, neighborhoods and stuff were more likely to get it. Wealthy people and politicians didn't usually get that disease. Right. Yeah. You had to be exposed to it okay. and it was highly contagious polio. Uh, whereas uh, Gillian Barr, because it's an autoimmune disease, it's something he didn't necessarily have to pick up. So it, it kind of solves a couple of little issues for us historically. It's like, oh, okay, he can be uh, isolated and still get it. But, but it's, it's easy to say that he didn't sleep at night. He was in a lot of physical pain. Oh, absolutely. This does not reduce uh, any of the pain or frustration or, or the horrible things he went through. In fact, it's more tragic because you can get over Gillian Barr syndrome. If you can catch it and mitigate the damage and treat it, you don't have to end up like FDR. You don't end up having uh, basically you know useless legs afterward. And that's a shame that with all his resources, he was never diagnosed properly. Right, exactly. Yeah, it, almost impossible for them. It, it matched the syndromes of polio so well, it would have been very tough for them to catch it, obviously. Even today. <laughs> right. So without catching it, the lasting effects for him were paralysis. And there's a, a book by Christine Wicker called The Simple Faith of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And what she wrote, the, the phrase struck me. It said, he felt as if God had betrayed him. Well, you know what? 39 years old, prime of your life, you know, father, famous. This has got to be tough. Right. Uh, if I go to the store and they have the wrong type of ice cream, I feel like God has betrayed me. Like it takes so much less for me to get demoralized, I feel. There's two people in line before me. Right. Yeah. I start, like I, sl I start rolling my eyes. Yeah, he loses his <laughs> legs. I, I stub my toe, and I feel like God has betrayed me. So it's 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 a sliding scale. But uh, he was a, he was a braver man than I. But as a strong Christian man, for him to say that and admit it, it means it means he was pretty devastated. Absolutely, yeah. He, he was a, a lifelong Christian, for what I could tell, and that was a big deal. And I, after uh, reading about the syndrome, I really understand the break he took. So he he took a break from politics. And he went out on a houseboat called the LaRuca. And while he was there, he kind of recouped and relaxed and just enjoyed the waves. And we've been talking about stress management and cortisol lowering. And this was a defense mechanism that would sort of kick in throughout his career, it seems. And on the LaRuca, he kept meticulous logs, even though he wasn't doing anything. Like, like literally did nothing. And I've got a log here if you'd, if you'd like me to read it. Please. So this is uh, from Tuesday, February 12th, and this is from FDR's log. It says, uneventful day, engines recovered from pneumonia, left Daytona, kept on south, till we became stuck in the mud before the haul over, anchored for the night, much playing, solitaire and parcheesi. Boring. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> so My, why even log that? Why would you have a journal of such nothingness? Right. My log would be uh, yeah, like much call of duty, ordered pizza, <laughs> drank beer, did nothing. Like it it's really sounds like that for the time. But we call this really chilling. 
yeah. he chilled out. He had to, right? Lowest. That's exactly right. Like that that's how uh, that's how in touch he was with his stress coping techniques, like his mechanisms to lower cortisol. That's really important to him. Well, I heard some other things too that he was the first president, probably the last president that had daily cocktail parties after work. So he really wanted not just him, but his inner circle, who he trusted to unwind, relax, so they could be their best for the next day at work. That makes perfect sense to me. Any other president, I would say that they're uh, they're just gold bricking, like they're just being lazy. But for him, because he accomplished so much, it makes perfect sense to my mind why he would have to lower cortisol every day like that. So who does that? FDR would, because he saw the value of stress management. FDR saw the value of lowering cortisol for his people too. He insisted on everyone in his circle joining him on vacation. And he insisted on sharing relaxation time with subordinates. When FDR bought and rebuilt a mineral spa in Georgia, he learned how to de-stress and he walked again. He walked in a mineral pool up to his neck. In a way, he couldn't walk on land anymore. He spent two-thirds of his net worth on restoring that spa in Georgia. And when he was done, he shared it with his people too. Not just his co-workers and family, he opened his spa to hundreds of polio patients so they could relax and recover their strength and walk again at his spa. Think about that. The man who stared down a torpedo on the deck of a battleship built a spa for him and his people to relax. Now let's look at our second misconception, that great leaders know their people, or more accurately, that great leaders can empathize with their people. Did you ever listen to FDR's fireside talks when you were in school? FDR's fireside chats made a real connection with the American family, and by building a bond with people, he helped restore the confidence of an emotionally shaken republic. They call it the Great Depression because we feel total hopelessness. We see the misery on people's faces when they can't afford food. We empathize. But it turns out empathy can be tricky for a high-status leader. So before I get into my uh, research into empathy, I want to ask real quick, you said he spent two-thirds of his net worth on a spa? That's right, almost everything he had. And since he's a politician, how much could that really be? Well, for most politicians, it wouldn't be much. But I did some study. FDR was a very rich man. And I don't mean rich because he had you know worked his way up. And he had old, old family money. He was a rich, blue-blooded American. So for him to put that much money into something is, is staggering. It's like, it's not Carnegie and Rockefeller, but it's, it's, it's pretty close. So that's not like a, a opening a corner store shop. That's, that's a full spa. Exactly. And then to turn it into a nonprofit before you had tax breaks and stuff and, and having all these people come and going, coming to us. But that's the thing about me that really speaks to me to see all these people who used to walk, who are, who are turned into wheelchairs and now they're able to walk again. I mean, it must be a beautiful sight to see all these miracles every day. That's incredible. I mean, like we, we hear about celebrities and like Jeff Bezos giving away to like a, a charity, like one a millionth of a percent of his wealth. And then here FDR is giving away two thirds refurbishing a spa. And that's the thing. And he's, he's inviting people, you know, that have a lot less means than him. These are people he would never, ever have been around in his whole life. It was a different class of people. And he's in a pool with them and they're walking with the president of the United States. I mean, it's a miracle. It's like, it brings tears to your eyes. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Right. I especially like the pictures of him walking in the spa. I've never thought of a president as being cuddly until I saw <laughs> the pictures of him like laughing and being goofy I was say that smile, in the water. That yeah. smile, it's pure joy. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. I can see why people voted for him. Um, talking about the fireside chats, yeah, I was watching that researching for the show, and I don't know if you've seen it. Have you seen it? I've I've listened to a couple of them. Okay. Well, when you see it, it's it's hilarious because in the modern day times, Eleanor Roosevelt is is knitting. <laughs> and it's this real awkward how it's set up. They're kind of facing at weird angles. You know, this is before we had YouTube and stuff where people knew how to produce their own show. Right. And there's like his grandmother, some old lady like passed out in the scene too. She's literally, <laughs> she looks like she's knocked out on dope. It's the most bizarre thing. 
Huge ratings, though. Big hit back in the right. day. <laughs> but she's just mouth open asleep. And I'm like, you better check hers. Make sure she's still ticking, man. <laughs> So is are those pictures? They they didn't. Did they have TV back then? It's a video. It was a video. Wow. Yeah. Okay. You got to watch it. You 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 don't <laughs> believe me. It's worse than I'm describing. Believe me. Yeah, that would that be great. It's like uh, maybe not his grandmother. Just like get us an old lady who's going to be unconscious <laughs> in the background. Yeah, who is that? <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays, it would be like uh, that. It would be whoever it is recording. It, it's going to look sleek and on YouTube. Yeah, and whoever's in it, it's planned. Oh no, this is they just propped a few chairs out there in front of a fake fire, and away they go. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't Boy Scout camp. This is real corny. Right. Well, the the uh, fireside chats. Um, that's kind of what we focused on in the research because that showed empathy. And there's um, the, the myth we're trying to bust is uh, CEOs have empathy. And, and not that they don't. That's not what we're implying. It's just that they have less capacity for empathy, as the research turns out. So I read an article that I found through Forbes that led back to the American Psychological Association. And it basically says that the more subordinates a leader has the less capacity for empathy they have. And the way they tested this is they used a empathetic accuracy gauge, whether or not they could identify the emotional states of their subordinates. So uh, to me, what, what my mind imagined is, you know, you walk out of your office and you look across, you know, like uh, the cubicles and you see your secretary and how quick can you identify that she's having a good day or that, you know, it's, there's obvious ones like she's in tears and you're like, oh, you know, what happened? She must have broken up with somebody. But their um, their accuracy for empathy got lower the more subordinates they had. So the non-obvious signs, they weren't able to connect them as quickly. Just dulls them. Dulls it, yeah. Right. And, and that makes sense to me. And it correlates at every level. So the more subordinates, the lower your capacity. And that went counter to what my imagination had. Like, like I always imagine like a CEO being like a general surveying their troops. Like they walk through there, they know all their people. They're like, "Howdy, son! I served with your father. Great man!" Right. And they, they happy birthday, Amanda. It's, it's your it's your it's anniversary today, isn't it? Right. Yeah. They didn't even know that they knew that they were alive. Yeah. Yeah. Movies and and Tom Cruise have taught me that they they know everybody in their office. They know their birthday's coming up. They they have you know. Now, of course, that can happen with like Google alerts, <laughs> but that's not the empathy we're talking about. Where we're talking about we're being talking able to visually identify in your brain, right? Off exactly, the top of your head, right? Yeah. So that's that's the uh, the research points to us having to work harder for that empathy if we have more subordinates, if at all, and that's the, that's the quick identification we're looking for. How did FDR seem to know his people so well? Here's the secret. FDR knew he couldn't empathize with everyone in America. So he did what all great leaders know to do. He allied himself with people who could empathize for him. First, let's talk about FDR's wife, Eleanor Roosevelt. This is a woman who could have an entire podcast devoted to her work with charities. She volunteered for the American Red Cross and the Navy hospitals during the First World War. Eleanor was also an activist in the Women's Union Trade League, the League of Women Voters, and the Civil Rights Movement. If you want to empathize with the needs of the American people, you couldn't do any better than Eleanor Roosevelt. I also understand there was another figure in FDR's life, a woman who acted as a gatekeeper for the president. So, uh, like you said... Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt could have her own podcast. In fact, she might. I haven't looked on Google Play yet. Um, but the one we're going to talk about, surprisingly, is not Eleanor. Uh, we're going to talk about a lady named Missy LeHand. So she was a blue-collar Irish-American worker, and she was really a, a salt-of-the-earth kind of woman. Uh, honest roots. And when she came to the position, she was more just an assistant to the president. And you can see pictures of her riding around in the president's car with him. And she eventually rose to the, uh, the position that is now called the White House Chief of Staff. And she's the only woman to ever hold that position. And the staff eventually ended up calling her the Queen of the White House. So we're talking about people who are uh, able to empathize 
for the captain or the CEO or the president, this to me seems like the woman you want to look at. Uh, she had senators and ambassadors who tried to get on our good side. Usually when you say that about somebody, it's, it's for corrupt purposes. It's if you try to get on someone's good side, you, you want them to show you favor, right? Right. This woman was just so knowledgeable about what she was doing and who was up to what around the president's orbit. She knew what the senators were there for. She knew what the ambassadors wanted. And she could uh, put them in his orbit, basically. So she didn't have the silver spoon. She wasn't connected. She was just hardworking and honest. Right. And became so valuable that he, that probably back then it was criticized that you can't have a woman with that kind of power in the White House. Right. It, it, it seemed like a preferential treatment for her, but what it really was, she was just that good at her job and knowing what people were there for. So FDR had two powerful women. He listened to both of them. Exactly. He had the woman who's plugged into all of these charities and the nation as a whole, and he had the woman who's plugged into the White House and who would, you know, empathize for him, basically. Uh, she literally was his gatekeeper. He had a garden door that uh, her office led through, and he was oftentimes out in that garden. And so she would gatekeep, and she would prioritize who was coming to see him for the day, depending on what their goals were and what they wanted from him. That's probably just as important to have someone on the inside, too, right? To get laws passed. and it, it, it seems that way. And if you look at pictures of her, she's somebody I would not want to tangle with. She, she's this <laughs> very stern Irish woman from that age. And it's, it's, it shows. Yeah, She'd get the best of us in a street fight. Wouldn't even be close. Be one-sided. Right, yeah. It'd be scrappy. I'd, I'd, I'd be begging her to stop. And, it, it, and this is the kind of person you want to empathize with everybody coming through. No nonsense. And they're highly aware of everything. I like women bossing me around. <laughs> I'm used to it. A certain comfort in it. Right. And and of course we always go back to the old the the old trope of behind every strong man is a powerful woman. Well, behind FDR was several powerful women. Yeah. That's great. I think what's really sign of character too is that he listened to them. Yes. You know, and followed their advice and he trusted them. All of his inner circle. Absolutely. If we can take a lesson away from this, it's we don't need to empathize with as many people as we think we do, if we're in power, what we need, we need a Missy LeHand. We need an Eleanor Roosevelt. We need somebody who can empathize for us. Great leaders know they can't empathize with everyone. But great leaders, like FDR, don't just accept this fact and move on. They employ underlings, secretaries, and skilled managers who can empathize on their behalf. Finally, we get to the myth that great leaders like FDR are discovered during times of stress. And you know how I know this is a common myth? Because we have sayings like, great men are forged in fire, and adversity builds character, and training under fire. We like to use that one in business, don't we? We learn under fire, under the gun. It builds character, doesn't it? So... Along the same lines of research, the Psychology Today and that Forbes article, the part about learning under the gun, apparently that's not really supported by science. Really? What we find is uh, you have a much better time uncovering leaders uh, who are hiding amongst your ranks by lowering the cortisol of your people, not raising it. So pile, piling all this work on all your people and stressing them all out, the good people are blowing out. So you're, you're losing some of your best resources in the future of your company. Right. What you're doing is you're um, proving the people who have already shown that they can cope with stress. So the people who are already either naturally coping with stress or they already have mechanisms in place, you're not revealing new leaders. You're actually just showing off that you have leaders already. Anyone that might be hiding in the wing, anyone that uh, you know might be a, a nascent leader who hasn't been covered yet, you're just making them run for cover. Well, Joe, being the, the writer that you are, what about you when you're a creative, on the creative side, when you're doing your writing? It's, can you do it? Can you under the gun deadlines or how, how does it work for you? Well, deadlines are different. Uh, um, I can cope with a deadline, but not so much with stress. If somebody wants me to write something, and they come in and they have a lot of pressure and they have a lot of stress, they're not revealing me to be a better leader. What they're doing is they're telling me I shouldn't work with them. So brilliantly, you're, you don't get more brilliant when they put a gun to your head. You don't write right. better stuff. It doesn't get creative and faster. 
Right, you get faster, but it does not get better. <laughs> um, but like quantity over quality. Right, exactly. You're, you're you're getting them at their stressed, which does not necessarily mean the best. Um, so like Amazon, uh, th- there's a lot of companies I was reading about uh, where they intentionally stress out their people. They they make it like a pressure boiler. Uh, in fact, the the word boiling or boiler room is part of that. So a marine boot camp to get you ready for the real world. They're going to say, "Hey, we're going to pile it on and." Right. It's the wrong approach. Yeah. Right. In fact, um, our vision of the Marines, where we you know, see TV and we see people screaming at them all the time to teach them, that's not a teaching technique. That's more breaking people down and revealing. But when they learn things, they do it slow and calm in a classroom. Like the actual teaching happens indoors slowly and safely. That's interesting. Yeah, I was in the Army, and that's true. Mm-hmm. The actual learning of this stuff is very detailed and very... Uh, intelligently done. It isn't just grunting and yelling and screaming. Right. And that's been my big takeaway from this research is if you want to uncover new leaders, don't stress them out and make them run for the sandbags. Mm-hmm. You introduce them to something slow and you you foster them, basically. FDR, for example, was homeschooled. He was raised in a fabulously wealthy environment and educated by tutors. Then he went to college, twice, once at Harvard and once at Columbia. And he was mediocre at both colleges. They called it gentleman seats, or what I call is like gentleman grades. You didn't go to class, you didn't take your exams, but because your parents were so rich, you got to be. When it was time to get into politics, FDR was selected by the Democratic Party. Selected. They thought it would look good if he could turn a Roosevelt into a Democrat. And they knew his family could pay for his campaign. In 1910, the Democrats asked FDR to run for state assembly in what they called a safe race. And he didn't even win that. The Democratic incumbent, Louis Stuyvesant, chose to run for re-election instead. FDR respected his party and he respected the incumbent, so FDR stepped aside. This isn't exactly under-the-gun training. FDR was homeschooled, educated, selected, and slowly exposed to politics. In business, we're told this is kind of coddling. We'll create a weak leader, a hothouse flower, but it didn't. It's true that FDR gave up the state assembly to the Democratic incumbent. Then he turned around and ran for the Senate seat instead, and he won. FDR wasn't on his own after he became a senator, either. He always had mentors, men and women who helped train him every step of the way. So, Todd, I had a quick question. Um, Wasn't FDR from a Republican family? He was. His uncle, very famous, very famous uh, president, Teddy Roosevelt, was a Republican. So him going and running for the Democratic is unheard of. And Teddy Roosevelt, uh, kind of like this crazy figure in everybody's mind. Yeah, a still renaissance alive. man. Yeah, and somebody you would probably follow his coattails, family money, and run on the same ticket, right? Right. Yeah, somebody who's, who's uh, larger than life and physically large, too. <laughs> like a very intimidating president who shot somebody in Spain. And you're going to go up and tell him, oh, by the way, Uncle Teddy, I'm going to run on the opposite party that you're on. Yeah, you get written out of your trust fund. It's stupid. Right, exactly. <laughs> but he, he did it, and so he stepped aside for the incumbent? He did, and that, that, that to me seems odd. I mean, you think that you know he's from this, this po- political family, and he's got all these people behind him, and he said he liked the guy and thought he'd do a good job. So, I mean, he's waiting. I always think of politicians cutting each other's throat for that. Right. Uh, in, in my mind, it would have been, you know, uh, you can step aside, old man. I'm here to take over. Exactly. <laughs> it's it's completely opposite from the the winner take all sort of mentality I've gotten from politics lately. Yeah, you, it t- it takes that to get there, right? You don't become the most powerful person in anywhere without stepping on a few people. Right. And because he did that, he got a bigger chair. Like he he yeah. went for a different office. So, I was reading about uh one of his mentors, a guy named Lewis Howe. Have you heard of him? I have. So, a uh, New York journalist uh, he he worked for the Herald, and 
uh, this was a guy who was completely against corruption on the Democratic side. So when um, when FDR went into the Democratic position, uh, from what I could understand, Lewis Howe kind of had his eye on him. And when he was fighting Tammany Hall, decided to get FDR in on it. And to, to sort of refresh everybody's memory, Tammany Hall was a Democratic institution that was around for a very long time. And it was basically a gathering point, and it was where everybody met uh, for making political deals. So if you're in the Democratic Party and you want to get a bill through and you want to make deals with people who are in your party, you go there, and it's all handshakes. Just, just if you can imagine just a lot of old white people shaking each other's hands and laughing about how much money they have. I was going to say probably sticking cash in each other's pockets too, probably, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> all of our preconceived notions. Like this is this after the, the skulls. Smoking the cigars inside. And yeah, I can right, see the Right, the inner organization. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and they were, if you read history, uh, they're wildly corrupt. Just like every corrupt deal out of the Democratic Party in that age came out of Tammany Hall, basically. And it made Lewis Howe physically ill. Right, yeah. Lew- Howe could not handle them. Like, he, he was fighting them, basically, for the rest of his career. And when FDR's campaign um, started taking its stride, it hit its stride, one of the interviews Howe did with him convinced Howe that he wanted to uh, follow FDR and mentor him. So this, we're talking about, you know, uh, cortisol and how you train leaders up and you really do have to mentor and foster them. FDR, this man we associate with being just, you know, harder than nails and tough as dirt and, and just impossible to, to scare him. He paired up with good mentors, including Lewis Howe. And Howe kind of uh, uh, brought him through his paces. I see Lewis Howe like this. Clark Kent, you know, he's a journalist. Then I see him as this also, you ever seen that movie, The Campaign? I have not. Okay, well, there's a guy in there that just is kick-ass, Armani suit, telling you every single thing to do, what to wear, how to talk, what kind of dog you can have. The guy's right. just a political genius, and he doesn't use it for his own good, but he sees it in other people. He could have picked anybody, but he picked FDR. Right, and he was so good at what you're talking about, the the pairing up with powerful people and helping them through their campaign. That's exactly what he did. And he's going against all the Democrats, too. Oh, yeah. Part. I mean, it sounds tough. Sounds like this couldn't happen. Right. <laughs> yeah, this this in itself should be a movie. This yeah. this is, yeah, he is about to fight the entire Democratic Party at Tammany Hall, and he pairs up with a young Democrat who is working on his career for the first time. So it's it's a really fun story. Um, and and how really tied himself to FDR's star. Like he, uh, in 1912, when FDR got uh, typhoid fever, Howe had to take over his campaign and and ran it for him uh, successfully for quite some time. And the way Howe described his relationship, um, he said that he provided the toe weights to slow down FDR because FDR was rearing to go at all times. And Howe was this seasoned man who knew exactly what pace you had to run a campaign at. And so he would would get in there and, in his own words, slow down FDR to his benefit. Because he would have burned himself out and he would have blown the whole campaign up. Right, exactly. You know, too much. He, he did that in life, too. He, um, Howe would visit him on the Luruka when he was sick. Uh, he, he would visit him uh, when he was ill with typhoid fever. In fact, one time he showed up uh, with the president's breakfast, uh, before he was the president. And he served him breakfast, and he said, this is to make you strong. I will see that you become the president of the United States. Oh, so yeah. Howe <laughs> was in his corner, and he was that mentor everybody wants. Smart, confident, honest. Exactly. Yeah. Competent, confident. I like that. Yeah, that's what you want in a mentor, right? Absolutely. We need to give FDR proper credit for doing what every great leader learns to do. FDR knew how to relax. He knew how to manage his cortisol level. It's true that FDR died in the winter circle, one month before Germany surrendered. But he died of a cerebral hemorrhage. That's a stress-related ailment. And did you know where he died? It wasn't on the deck of a battleship. It wasn't in the White House. FDR, the winning president, died relaxing at a spa in Georgia. Leaders aren't revealed by being put under fire. They're revealed by careful mentoring, slow exposure, and adequate training. Nobody is born stress-proof. No leader is born reading minds. The best leaders among us know they need a little help connecting with their team. The best leaders know the value of slow exposure and mentoring. 
the best leaders know how to distress when they aren't facing down a speeding torpedo. Whatever your position in life, a leader or subordinate, a president or a plumber, stress and cortisol management will determine your ceiling. Okay, Todd, uh, we're working on a website. (laughs) If our fans want to uh, connect with us, ask questions, or argue with me about history, uh, where can they find us? Just look up the Reengineered You. And uh, Reengineered You on our website, and you can find show notes, information about what we talked about, where we got our sources. And of course, you can message us, and we can discuss history and science. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Right. Like, subscribe, all that stuff they ask for on every website you've ever been to. (laughs) 